Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Monday, January 11th, 2021, and today we're going to be taking a look at how the Democratic Party won in the Georgia runoff elections. Now, 538 published this article on January 7th. It's very likely that they had already written this article and that they were just publishing it because the Democrats, of course, won that evening. But uh, there are a number of points, very valid points that were made throughout this article and other ones that I don't believe they've mentioned or went too in depth about that I think were the ultimate contributors as to why the Democratic Party was able to uh, win by even, you know, some substantial margins in the state of Georgia in these two Senate elections. Now, John Ossoff ran ahead of Joe Biden by roughly five times uh, the margin of victory and uh, not David Perdue, sorry, Raphael Warnock did the same by actually around 10 points. So uh, not 10 points, by 10%. What we saw was something that was a repudiation of the Republican rhetoric that the election was not over, that Georgia is somehow a very solid, very conservative state, uh, which has shown us very recently that it is now a swing state, that it is now a state that the Republican Party is going to need to fight for. And I think that this state specifically was a state that was taken for granted by the Republican Party uh, for decades. And now that the Democratic Party has finally made inroads back there, uh, they're going to have to treat this very similarly to how the Democratic Party treated Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, long-lasting uh, partisan states that have since changed their tides in one direction. But Georgia actually went from being a state with two Republican senators uh, where the Democratic Party really didn't contest in 2016. It was always there. It was always within a realm of possibility, considering that Hillary Clinton was within single digits of Donald Trump uh, in terms of the preliminary polling data. But no Democrat in 2016 had really focused too intently on winning the state on the presidential level. It was winning it uh, in House races, competitive House districts, winning it uh, on statewide races, but not on the presidential level. And then in 2020. Following Stacey Abrams' uh, defeat in 2018 in the governorship, well, instead of running for Senate or instead of running for House of Representatives, which she very well could have, and I have no doubt that she would have won this Senate race. But there was always that possibility, you know, had Stacey Abrams not decided to uh, focus on the state of Georgia to try to change the ties, you know, would it even have turned blue? You know, I still actually question maybe she wouldn't have won that Senate race because the state would not be as blue as it was on Election Day because of her efforts. But Obviously, you know, that's all speculation. Today, we're going through the reasons why the Democratic Party was able to win in the state of Georgia besides Stacey Abrams, besides her uh, ability to lay out the groundwork, you know, for future Democrats to win in this battleground state. It was a state that Donald Trump had said that he shouldn't be contesting because he knows he has it solidly wrapped up. Well, we found out on election night that that simply was not true. So 538 actually outlines a few things that I don't think are um, super important to note. Some of these things are just uh, interesting election swings for the, you know, the first thing that they mention is that this is the second time since 1998 that the Democratic Party was able to gain in terms of runoff elections. Um, they did it in the Public Service Commission and in both Senate elections, but they only won the Senate elections. They lost the Public Service Commission, which coincidentally was actually the last time the Democratic Party gained in the runoffs. But in the 21st century, it had never happened for the Democratic Party in Georgia. And looking at the difference this time, the Democrats gained 2.6% uh, in the uh, regular election and 2.7% in the special election. So the Democratic Party did do pretty well. They were able to win over three points, roughly uh, more support than they did in the regular election. But I don't think this is something that we really need to harp on. I don't think we need to focus too intently on that. But turnout is definitely something I think we should be heavily covering because what we saw in this runoff election was turnout, uh, you know, comparable to no other election, comparable to no other election. The runoff turnout actually exceeded 2016 presidential election turnout in November. Georgia had never really seen uh, th this high level of turnout that they've never experienced this in a runoff election. The last time that the Democratic Party gained in terms of the runoff election that happened after a November election was in 1998. Guess how many people voted in that election? 2% of registered voters. 2%. In 2020, it was 60%. And I know what you may be thinking. 60% isn't a lot, right? Right. Well, it actually is. 60% is a lot 
that is higher than 2016 turnout, which was actually around 57, 58%. And the population increases. So when you see 60%, the number actually may be higher in terms of raw vote share than you would expect. But population increases, especially increasing across the uh, southern region of the United States. But 4.444 million people voted in the runoff election. Even in 2008, only 2.137 million people voted in the runoff election. Looking at the amount of support that we saw in the uh, for both sides in 2020 was comparable to no other election. Comparable to no other election. The 60% of eligible voters number is a very good number for the Democratic Party. Because it was able to drive up turnout in regions of the state where we had not seen high levels of turnout before besides the 2020 presidential election. And I know you see the other numbers, but generally, you know, our rule of thumb is that when turnout is higher, the Democratic Party does better. Well, this was the highest level of turnout for any runoff election in Georgia um, in quite some time now since the 90s and, you know, probably even way before then. But looking at the low turnout, 34 percent in 2008, well, of course, that's going to be a Republican swing. You see how much it swung to the Republican Party? It was a 2.9% uh, margin of victory for the Republican on Election Day, 14.9 in the runoff. So significant gains when turnout is lower. But when turnout was at an all-time high, well, the Democratic Party, as you know, did exceptional in these two Georgia runoff elections. But they also point out that Ossoff did worse than Biden in well-educated counties. I think they use Ossoff as the standard Democrat because he was the one who won by the narrowest amount. It wouldn't really make sense to compare both Ossoff and Warnock at every stance just because Warnock did better than Ossoff, did better than Biden. That's sort of the understanding story. Ossoff is the worst performing Democrat besides Biden, who actually did, uh, I would argue, uh, considerably worse than John Ossoff. He was within you know, a percentage point of losing the election. Ossoff could have still seen the state swing by 1% away from him and still win the election. But Ossoff did worse than Biden in well-educated counties. But we aren't, you know, we don't need to focus too heavily on that. I think that's largely due to the fact that a lot of those voters were looking to balance um, the government, trying to hold a check on a president-elect Biden. But black voters actually voted for Ossoff more than they did for Joe Biden, which I think is very fascinating. I think that's very interesting. I think it largely has to do with the fact that um, what we saw was a major effort from a specifically black organizers, even more specifically black women organizers that were fundamental to the Democratic Party's success in this state. Uh, overall, minority voters really shifted in favor of the Democratic Party, and it also could be due to the fact that Donald Trump won over more black voters than uh, he did in 2016. Maybe black voters are just as Democratic as they were in the past, just Joe Biden was on the ballot or Donald Trump was on the ballot. There's a whole number of different, you know, polarizing figures that were on the ballot that could have skewed the way that many minorities voted, people of color, uh, in this state specifically, that maybe when it was just plainly Democrat versus Republican, only two options, well, they ended up siding with the Democratic Party more often than they sided with the Republican Party by very considerable amounts. And that's actually what largely ran Joe Biden uh, to victory in Georgia, but also John Ossoff to an even larger margin of victory. And also, turnout goes both ways. Republican-leaning counties saw lower turnout. Gee, I wonder why. When the top of the ticket guy is telling you that the election is rigged, you may not be too inclined to vote. President Trump suffered a dipping approval rating following his baseless claims of election fraud. On election day, Trump had a roughly 45% approval rating. It has since dropped to 41.9%. From 44.5 to 41.9%, you can see how quickly his approval dropped amongst the American people. You can't imagine if he already lost Georgia when his approval was 45 that he would do any better when his approval was 42. And I understand he may not have been the one directly on the ballot, but these candidates were vehemently defending him at every single stance. And also, you know, Kelly Loeffler did not help herself by being that 100% pro-Trump candidate when he didn't even win the state to begin with. But the Democratic Party was counting on lower turnout in Republican-leaning counties. They expected, you know, maybe the turnout would increase on Election Day, but at the end of the day, that didn't actually happen. That didn't actually happen. You know, you can see there's a very clear correlation between Republican support and turnout levels. The Democratic Party saw exceptionally high turnout relative to the 2020 general election, sometimes almost hitting it. Right around here, you know, this county specific, almost there, within a few percentage points of 2020 presidential turnout. And you see, that's really the full extent of what the article likes to cover. But I think, you know, since we've already talked about turnout, we should talk about President Trump and how he lost this state 
on the presidential level and what that actually means for uh, Georgia Democrats moving ahead. Because what we saw in Georgia was, you know, despite Florida shifting to the right, despite North Carolina still voting with the Republican Party, Ohio, Iowa still leaning to the right, the Democratic Party was able to pick up Georgia and Arizona. But Georgia was more of a surprise. You know, Georgia didn't even go for Obama in 2008. It was won by McCain by nearly nine points. And Obama won North Carolina. Obama won Florida. Obama nearly won Missouri. To put it into perspective, North Carolina, uh, sorry, not North Carolina, Georgia and North and South Dakota were roughly the same margins of victory for John McCain. North and South Dakota and Georgia. Now, isn't that something? Isn't that fascinating? Georgia and West Virginia shared the same characterization. So looking at Georgia, it has come a long way for the Democratic Party, but it, it did not come easy. It certainly did not come easy for the Democrats. There were countless election losses, you know, sacrificial lambs, as many people would like to say. But these people that, sure, lost Senate races, lost uh, House races, lost governor races, were fundamental into actually consistently pushing the state to the left. Hillary Clinton did it. And even though Joe Biden may not have performed as well amongst minority voters, the suburbs hugely took away from Donald Trump. But the Republicans in these Senate elections were counting on that not occurring. You know, for whatever reason, they thought they were going to be immune to the decrease in support that Donald Trump had based off suburban voters. But it was very clear and very evident prior to election day that that simply was not true. These were enablers of President Trump. These were enablers of a candidate who lost the state on the presidential level. These were people telling the vo voters in Georgia that their election was rigged indirectly calling on the resignation of Brad Raffensperger, uh, Brad Raffensperger, attacking the incumbent governor who was just elected two years ago. Kelly Leffler, someone who was viewed as a transplant, David Perdue and her both caught up in the idea of insider trading. All of this piled on, and Donald Trump being that, st that very familiar face, that very no name that's being tied to their campaign ads time and time again, well, the problem is, Donald Trump didn't win the state. And that's what I simply could not comprehend about the strategy. If you've watched my channel since the election, you will know that I mentioned, oh, Kelly Loeffler, she's just going to cling on to Trump until she wins the primary. Then she's going to return to being a centrist. Didn't happen. She lost. David Perdue, someone who didn't necessarily cling on to President Trump right away, but needed to after the election fraud. I said, he's going to start pushing away. I'm telling you, wait for it. Wait for it. It would be stupid not to. Well, that was their decision. And they lost. So looking at everything that happened, you know, clinging on to President Trump seemed to be the final blow for these Republicans um, because President Trump was dipping in terms of popularity. I mentioned this multiple times. He didn't win the state originally. And one thing that I think really should have been a major warning sign for the Republican Party that they were going to lose was the preliminary early voting data. Four million people voted early in Georgia in the 2020 presidential election. Only 28 percent of them were black. 27.7 to be more precise. In this election, it jumped up significantly. Based off of a breakdown by race, 31% of voters in this runoff election were black in the early vote. By the time all the votes were counted, it actually increased to 32%. The Democratic Party shifted the entire state to the left despite nothing in history telling them that they could do this. Nothing in history. But when we saw these preliminary uh, racial breakdown numbers, I knew, and I mentioned this, that the Democratic Party was going to be in the advantage. I counted on these Republican congressional districts and counties to turn out at higher rates on election day. And for some of them, they did. But for the rest of them, they did not. The rest of them, the majority of them, they did not turn out in levels that they should have. Because if they did, the Democratic Party would not have won both of these Senate races. They would not have. So the Democratic Party won based off low Republican turnout. They won based off of Donald Trump's lack of support in these states. The Senate results put the Democratic Party in the majority. They paid the price. Minority voters voted at a higher rate. And the approval rating of President Trump dipped as a result of his baseless claims. And we knew that this election was going to the Democrats, but you should never put too much faith in polling data. But in Georgia, it was exceptionally accurate, almost to a T in this election. We can see Warnock won by two, Ossoff won by 1.1%. Well, it was only off by less than a percentage point for each. Same thing on the presidential level. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. But if you actually take a look at the state-by-state uh, -state shift from November, well, we're using John Ossoff as just the reference. Look at that. Wow. A lot of blue. And that did not come easy for Democrats.
They need to thank minority activists, black activists, black women activists. They are the reason why this state turned even more to the Democratic Party. And yes, a lot of it also has to do with the suburban region in the Atlanta metro area. But at the same time, they should acknowledge this. So for all of those reasons, I think that the Democratic Party uh, should really be thankful that they were able to um, able to win these two Senate races. And there were a multitude of reasons for that. And I think all of the reasons I outlined were amongst the major ones. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Uh, I wanted to also point out that looking ahead into the future, you know, I would love to hear from you guys. I don't really focus on that too heavily at the end of the video, but I do want to hear from you guys about what you want to see. You know, there's an upcoming New York City uh, race. There's an upcoming governor's race. There's an upcoming New Jersey and Virginia actually governor race, uh, state legislature races. So whatever you guys want to see, make sure to comment that down below. I don't really say that super explicitly. I always mention it briefly at the end of the video, but I actually want to hear from you guys because a lot of your video ideas, you know, I actually implement and I think it's great to hear. But thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.